Should the Denver Broncos sign veteran tight end Kyle Rudolph, who came in for a visit last week, but what would he do for the Broncos in 2022, not to mention the other tight ends inside that room? Plus, which Broncos player has the most to prove here in 2022? We gather responses from members of our Broncos community on Twitter, and you get that and much more in today's brand new episode, Locked on Broncos. You are Locked on Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Broncos country? Welcome back into a brand new episode of Lockdown Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast here on the Lockdown NFL Network, your team every day from the South Stands to the end zone. I'm your host, as always, Cody Rourke, joined alongside by my co-host, Sarah Bettinger. Both of us, we cover the Denver Broncos for the Lockdown Network and 9 News. Broncos country, thank you so much for making Lockdown Broncos your first listen of the day every single day on your favorite audio podcasting platform or here on YouTube. Make sure you hit that subscribe button, turn on notifications so you never miss out on any days worth the Denver Broncos news, content, and coverage. Sarah, my friend, hey, we're getting one step closer to this Broncos season from getting here. Off-season programming stuff begins here this week. We know that today the Broncos will officially begin their off-season conditioning, and with that there will be a multitude of other storylines, my friend. But, hey, an interesting one, too. The Broncos could add a veteran tight end to the mix here alongside Albert Okwebunam and Eric Tomlinson. Yeah, they could. You know, I was texting you earlier in the day here and just saying, man, I wish the Broncos would sign Kyle Rudolph so we could talk about, you know, his potential impact on the team. And you're like, let's talk about it anyway. So here we are, Kyle Rudolph, a potential Denver Broncos signing. We'll see what happens. You know, over the weekend, it was reported by Jay Glazer and Mike Kliss, the Nine News Insider for the Denver Broncos, uh, that, that Kyle Rudolph had a visit and a workout with the team. So, Typically, those are followed by signings. You know, I don't. I guess I don't necessarily know what. I mean, Kyle Rudolph, what his plans are for the season. If he wants to kind of take a little tour of teams or whatever, whoever's interested in potentially signing him. But look, I, I like this this potential move at this stage in the game. You know, I was hoping way early on in free agency for a, a veteran tight end to come in and not just push Albert Okwebunam, but really be kind of that guy that's out there maybe half the time. And so I like the the idea of Kyle Rudolph. He's great for the locker room, great for the franchise, great for the community. Uh, and George Payton, obviously very familiar with him from their time together in Minneapolis. I mean, that was the part I was going to mention, right? Like the ties that bind, like it's a business about who you know. And I know for Kyle Rudolph too, after he departed the Minnesota Vikings, I know he had a little bit of a rocky start to his time with the New York Giants last season. I know that there was the whole uh, physical test. I know he had suffered a foot injury, but I don't know what they did. They did something with this contract to make it to where he could play and ended up being one of those rotational guys for them last season. But I think that would be valuable, maybe adding a guy like Kyle Rudolph to this mix. Now he's not going to be the Kyle Rudolph of old that was going up and elevating over dudes and being a big time pass catching red zone threat he may be a guy that's more of a possession receiver at this point in time in his career but then again it's like you know a new environment could change everything for him but I think that the familiarity there I think is especially important for the Broncos to have I mean you factor in Russell Wilson wherever he's kind of been and with Seattle they've always kind of had a veteran tight end presence whether it be at one point Jimmy Graham whether point be Greg Olson now you can get a guy like Russell Wilson another veteran option that could be reliable like a Kyle Rudolph that could also help mentor a guy like Albert Okuwebunam and not to mention even Eric Tomlinson too I don't think it would hurt at this point to do it. And if the Broncos can find a way, I imagine probably the market value would be like a one year, maybe a $4.5 million contract, something up there. That's just an estimate. I'm not a salary cap guru by any means, but I think it would add tremendous value to this Broncos office. I think the more veteran help that you can get, I think the more continuity you can have all across the offensive side of the ball. But, you know, in terms of that, is he also doing his due diligence? I'm talking about George Payton. Is he doing his due diligence by looking at veteran options? Because I look at Kyle Rudolph here, and sir, part of me is intrigued by bringing in a an older veteran option here because it reminds me of what the Broncos deal with one former Denver Bronco great who we all know and love, very under the radar, and that was Owen Daniels. I feel like this might have a similar vibe to it if, in fact, the Broncos and Rudolph can come to terms on a contract. It kind of does have Owen Daniels vibes, doesn't it? You bring in the veteran QB and then you get him, you know, some of his old buddies or people that he likes at the tight end position all the way back to, I mean, remember Peyton had Jacob Tammy and they brought in like James Casey one year and, 
Uh, just an interesting host of guys that they brought in at the tight end position. But I like having a veteran option there, especially if your plan is to draft somebody. You know, you've got to have a mentor for these players at the tight end position. It's one of the hardest. And we know that transitioning from college to the NFL, of course, we get it. Every position is tough to transition, but tight end is, I mean, pretty historically very, very difficult for these young players to come from college to the pros. So if you're planning on bringing somebody in, like in our mock draft that you can go back and watch and listen to, Jelani Woods out of Virginia, somebody who was previously a quarterback, you know, having somebody, a veteran like Kyle Rudolph to really teach these guys the ropes on how to be a pro, how to play the position right, how to be a dual threat at the tight end position, which is being a receiver and a blocker, really getting somebody in there that's not your position coach, I think that could be a huge help. And like you said, these guys, he may not be elevating over DBs and mossing people in the end zone anymore, but I, I bet you Kyle Rudolph with his sure hands would be a nice third down option for the Denver Broncos, provided he could stay healthy. I personally would be in huge favor of this move, especially for the locker room ramifications. Well, Broncos country, let us know what you think. Would you like to see Kyle Rudolph in a Denver Broncos uniform here in 2022? Let us know in the YouTube comment section or tweet us on Twitter at Cody Rourke NFL at Sarah Bettinger at Locked On Broncos. But coming up here in just a moment, we're going to open up some of our Broncos community mailbag questions, not to mention what's the latest in the Broncos ownership situation and one potential bidder has emerged. We weigh the pros and the cons and the optics of it, especially considering the future of this franchise coming up here in just a moment. But before we do that folks let us tell you about betonline.net the sponsor of today's episode lockdown broncos and betonline.net is your number one source for all your betting stats and sports information find all the latest sports developments league reviews and news including this year's basketball playoffs and the start of the major league baseball season betonline is your continued source for all your sporting wagering information from live betting to playoffs esports and more so head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and the action betonline where the game starts. And as we jump into the second half action on today's episode, Lockdown Broncos, once again, Broncos country, thank you so much for making Lockdown Broncos your first listen of the day for daily Denver Broncos news, content, and coverage. We appreciate all the interaction that we get, and it gives you a chance as a Broncos fan to share your thoughts as well here on the forum that we have created with Locked On Broncos. Sarah, my friend, let's get into some of our community mailbag questions. Before we get into one that kind of asks the question about which Broncos players do we feel have the most to prove here in 2022, I want to touch on something that obviously we found a little bit more information about on Friday. It was announced that the Walton family has emerged as one of the highest potential bidders for the Broncos' ownership. And this is a huge deal. And if you don't know the Walton family, obviously Sam's Club, Walmart, they own every franchise. It's just a family uh, of that nature right there. And the, the concerns that I have with this, Sarah, and, and look, like I said, this just could be outside opinion. This is just my perspective. I don't know if that's necessarily going to change the game for the Denver Broncos. Like, sure, it gives them an owner that is very cash rich, has a lot of money. But at the same time, is this person, is the Walton family going to be as invested in the Denver Broncos as Mr. Bolin? Is this going to be something as the NFL continues to look towards having a minority owner for an NFL team? Is this help or does this hurt their initiative? And I think it hurts it in a sense, especially when there are various minority owners and potential owners that are preparing to submit bids here for owners. Ownership, which the process should be finalized in about six months for the final auction, Sarah. I'm not sure how you felt about the Walton family in terms of doing this. I mean, it's obviously a lot of pockets, a lot of money. The bid estimated to be worth around a little bit more than north of $4 billion, sir, which, you know, to me, that's the Broncos' value. I mean, it's an extensive franchise, but I just don't know how I'd feel if the Walton family became owners of this franchise. I just, I don't think the namesake is good for it, in my opinion. Right. And, and the last thing you want is exactly what you alluded to, is that you don't want the Denver Broncos to just be part of somebody's portfolio. I mean, that would be extremely lame in this whole in this whole process. The last thing that I personally would want is somebody that just wants the Broncos to be part of their business portfolio. You know, NFL teams, they don't come for sale all that often. And in recent years, we've seen like the Carolina Panthers and potentially here in the near future, maybe the Washington Commanders could come for sale as well. So I think these 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 some of these bidders feel like more like vultures than they do people who actually want to own the Denver Broncos, which really bothers me. But I, I mean, like like you said, it, the highest bidder is going to get the team. So like if somebody really loves the Denver Broncos and they really really want to own the team, 
you're just going to have to put together a more competitive package than than the Walton family, which I mean, again, I don't know. I don't know what their intentions are. I don't know if they like, I mean, I've never heard of them being Denver Broncos fans. I, I guess I don't know. And I don't know that that's necessarily yeah. a requirement. They could become Denver Broncos fans, of course. But at the same time, it's like you really want somebody like Mr. B that that bled orange and blue and, and I, I, don't, I just don't know. I'm very skeptical of this whole process, Cody. I haven't really heard of uh, any candidates for the ownership that I really like love at this point. Sounds like the people that thought maybe Richard Smith was the best candidate, uh, the Denver native, right? So, I mean, he doesn't sound very interested, which means, I mean, should we be interested in him <laughs> as the owner then? I don't know. So yeah. I have mixed feelings on That's the whole deal. That's a great deal. point. I mean, that's the issue too, I think. And, and I think one thing that really matters is whoever the next owner is going to be, regardless of their bid, has to be approved by 24 votes amongst other NFL league owners at this point. And I just hope that that's something that's seriously vetted without this process. Like it's going to be a major payday for the Broncos organization, obviously for the Bolin family in terms of what Pat Bolin has built. The legacy is built for Denver Broncos football. And I think a lot of fans have concerns about, hey, if there's a new owner, would they potentially relocate the Denver Broncos? If that were to ever happen, if that idea ever got floated out there, I would hope that the NFL would step in and say, hey, Denver is never moving. This is going to be a, a franchise that stays here forever. We're not interested in moving in. I hope people would come to their senses and say, hey, that's not going to happen. But then again, you never know. I just I would be very devastated. And I think that whoever the next owner is going to be, I'm just going to say it again here, they need to have as much investment, as much love in the Broncos, both on and off the field, as Pat Bowen did. They need to be as invested in the day-to-day Boots on the ground need to be as involved with everything that is going on as Mr. Bullen was. And if simply they cannot do that, then they should step aside because this franchise has such a historic legacy to it that it shouldn't be tainted by business portfolios. I'm with you on that one, Sarah. But you know what? Let's get let's continue on here today. And I know Broncos country is very concerned about ownership and what that may look like. We are as well. Trust us. Uh, coming into one of the questions on our Broncos community mailbag on Twitter, which Broncos player do you feel is the most approved in 2022? Now, the first one, Sarah, comes in from our good friend Dakota at DMARC0812 on Twitter. He says, I know this may be crazy, but I'm going to say Russell Wilson. The reasoning is all eyes are on Denver for this transaction. Some national media doubt him if he's still that guy. A lot on his plate to start winning from the jump, especially with how tough Broncos fans are on quarterbacks. If he doesn't win the first season, you know very well people will be talking, but I feel that he's that guy at quarterback and he's still elite. Does this make sense that Russ maybe has the most pressure on him out of everybody on the Broncos roster here in 2022? I like that pick, Dakota. I really do. I think that's a I think that those are great reasons as well. Like the the public eye is back on the Denver Broncos. They're gonna get nationally televised games they're going to get pressure from the media they're going to get attention I, I think absolutely and and lumping into the fact that I mean there are some that doubt whether Russ is still an elite level quarterback which I think does place a lot of pressure on him look he's selling out jerseys I mean they're out there basically anointing this guy at the Colorado Rockies season opener you know they I mean everybody just a standing ovation at the Denver Nuggets game everybody is in love with the idea of what he can bring to the table. Can you live up to those expectations? I'd say that's a lot of pressure, Cody. So I would say, I mean, I think I agree. I think that's a great pick uh, for for the player that has the most pressure and most approved in 2022. I'd say Russell Wilson is right up there, and one of his pass catchers might be up there as well. Well, let's get to the next one here. Coming in from Peter Nova on Twitter. He says, most approved Jerry Judy. We know the talent is there, and we have made excuses for production since he's been here, and rightfully so. He says, second, I would say Bradley Chubb, though even with a good year, I don't see him being back in Denver next year. This is interesting, too. And, Peter, you know, I'll touch on your thoughts here for a brief moment. Uh, you know, for Jerry Judy, yeah, you're right. The talent is 110% there. We have seen it. And I know that there have been so many different variables that have impacted Jerry Judy. And I know one of the biggest things, too, coordinator, quarterback, well, you know, I think that excuse is now probably out the window this year. Like, this is a big year for Jerry Judy. But I also think, too, like, in the eyes, I know Broncos fans want him to have to prove it, but I think at the end of the day, Jerry Judy's just focused on going out there and balling. I don't even think he has anything to prove to himself. I just think that there's a lot of people with eyes on him. So with that normal pressure that you get, especially from social media, especially from everything that you do, will be under a microscope, especially entering your third season in the league. 
I do think that it is definitely a good selection to put Jerry Judy here. Um, I think it's very interesting. I think a majority of Broncos fans would say that there are several other ones that did that. And Sarah, I'll touch on what uh, Colton, what Sly Daddy had said, at Colton M8723355. It's a long Twitter handle, Colton, but I appreciate you always interacting with our show here. He says, it's got to be Judy, right? Hasn't lived up to his potential. Yeah, he had an injury, but he's got to step his game up this year and show why we drafted him so high. Your thoughts here on Jerry Judy? You know, I think Jerry has a lot to prove this year. At the same time, you know, excuses are one thing. Sending a guy in motion on every play and not <laughs> utilizing him as a route runner, which is his best attribute, is a completely other. I think that we saw that throughout the course of the year. You could make excuses for any number of players for poor performance. The issue is, is we're not really excusing Jerry Judy for poor performance. We're talking about the fact that his offensive coordinator basically, you know, sent him running ladders up and down the field all game. So, and that was consistent when he was, when he was on the field, Jerry was running in motion the majority of the time as a decoy. We talked about that on countless episodes of the show last season. So I don't think it's necessarily an excuse for him. I do agree though. I think the pressure's on it's year three and we want to see that production. we we talked about this on another recent show that his last touchdown was that final regular season game of his rookie season against the Raiders. That really long touchdown from drew lock uh, that should have won that game against the Raiders, but it didn't. So that the pressure is on and Jerry has a lot to prove this year to prove to people. Hey, I, you know, his great route running and ability to separate that can translate to elite level production. Well, our friend Marco Navarro says Calvin Anderson is getting a shot at right tackle to start this year in a contract year with two vets that were also signed on one-year deals to compete with him. I say, yeah, there's probably definitely a lot of pressure here for Calvin, but I think the one thing that benefits him, I say he and Billy Turner probably the most is the fact that they could each play either side, left tackle, right tackle. So I think they have both a little bit more value than maybe like a guy like Tom Compton. As you know, he can play probably on the interior, but the Broncos already have enough interior guys as is and depth pieces behind a guy like Dalton Reisner, behind a guy like Quinn Miners or Graham Glasgow, whoever decides to get the starting job here this season. It's really the tackle position I think that you have to have the most impact versatility at, and I think that that's what Calvin provides at left tackle behind Garrett, but he could also start at right. He could also be a backup at right tackle. I mean, I think that's where Calvin maybe has a little bit of you know benefit fit to this. So I wouldn't necessarily say he has a lot of pressure on him, but I do think that he's in a really good position to prove himself for the Broncos. And look, he's also one of those players that I feel like if the Broncos were to ever let go, he would pick on somewhere else, like carry on there, and he would play an impact role for whatever team decides to pick him up. I think that's where Calvin is there. But Broncos country, we're getting into some more of your Broncos community mailbag questions coming up here in just a moment, including whether or not the Broncos will take a running back in this year's NFL draft. You get that much more coming up here in just a moment. But before before we do that, let me tell you about Built Bar, the sponsor of today's episode, Lockdown Broncos. And folks, as you know, Built Bar is the healthiest protein bar on the market. It's the tastiest protein bar that is out there on the market today. If you love protein bars that are covered in 100% milk chocolate, that are soft and are easy to chew and taste delicious, well, Built Bar is exactly the protein bar you need to add into your arsenal here today. And Built Bar contains nine amazing original flavors, including salted caramel, double chocolate, peanut butter brownie, and more, plus the occasional limited time flavors like the Built Puffs. Check out the wide variety of flavors that they offer at Built.com. And if you need a little bit extra fuel to get yourself through your day each and every day, plus you love the little bit of a divergence between something that's healthy for you and a treat, well, Built Bars contain 17 grams of protein, 130 calories, and only 4 grams of sugar. Tremendous value for something that contains 100% milk chocolate. So go to Built.com today, and when you go to checkout, make sure you use promo code Lock 15, that's one word, Lock 15, and that's going to get you 15% off your next order at Built.com. As we jump into the fourth quarter action on today's episode, Lockdown Broncos, once again, Broncos country, thank you so much for joining us here today for a brand new episode of the show, free and available everywhere you get your podcast and audio format here on YouTube. Make sure you're subscribed, you hit that notifications button so you never miss out on an episode. If you love this episode so far, please do us a favor, smash that like button for the algorithm, comment, share your thoughts on this episode on YouTube as well. Lockdown Broncos, we continue to grow for everybody here in Broncos country, continuing on with our Broncos community mailbag. Sarah, we got a really good question from Darius Wilkins, and he says, will George Payton target another running back in the NFL draft this year? Do you see that happening? If so, when? I think this is a great question. 
It is a great question, Darius. And shout out to Darius. We're going to have to find him at training camp this coming year, Cody. I know he was there last year and we just missed him. So, um, yeah. But I, I think that absolutely you, you take a running back in this class. I've been saying for a few months now, I think you need to take two guys. And the fact that the Broncos haven't re-signed Melvin Gordon up to this point it just confirms my belief that you got to take two backs in this class. In our mock draft, we had them getting Brees Hall at pick 75, I believe, which would be absolute thievery in this draft class, maybe getting the best running back at that slot. So I would be interested in running backs as high as pick 64. I know that's not a popular take, and I know that a lot of people won't share it. That's okay. I just feel like you invested in Russell Wilson. Put the best possible pieces around him. Javante Williams not going to be able to carry the ball 350 times and play all 17 games you can't bank on that in this this day and age of the NFL you just can't and I'm not banking quite yet on Mike Boone either I know that that the that George Payton obviously likes him bringing him over but I would consider taking two backs from this year's draft Cody I would go as high as 64 but I'm not opposed to waiting either until day three to take two guys but I would definitely take for sure one my preference take two Nah, you know, you can never go wrong with taking two. Like when I have cookies there, I can't just have one. I got to take two when I have cookies there. At Broncos Fanatics on Twitter also says, is there any chance that we make offers to Melvin Gordon or Bryce Callahan? Now, I think on this point, we've kind of touched on this a little bit. I think for Melvin Gordon, I think his time in Denver more than likely is probably going to be up at this point. And the reason I say that he had a visit with the Baltimore Ravens on Friday, and apparently there's interest there, but it kind of contradicts what we have heard about Melvin Gordon wanting to be the premier back because they have J.K. Dobbins and Gus Edwards, both returning from injury I just don't see how they'll pay him in Baltimore and also make him the feature back when you have those two guys who offer a more established role inside that offense there I don't know I mean maybe he's going to change his tune a little bit on that Bryce Callahan in my opinion I feel like would probably be more than likely to return to the Broncos out of those two, I'd probably go with the Bryce Callahan route right now because the Broncos still need some more cornerback help. And look, you're adding a guy when healthy can be one of the best nickels in the entire league. Now, Sarah, let's get to our final question on today's episode, Lockdown Broncos. Comes in here from Tyson Harvey. This is interesting because this kind of ties in with our Locked On mock draft that we're doing here on the Locked On Sports Network here. It says, any chance David Ajabu falls to Denver? Is he worth trading up to the 40s for? And what is his market? I think this is a great question because you and I were entertaining the idea in our Locked On NFL mock draft of our ideal selection at 64 would be David Ajabu out of Michigan. Why or why not? Well, I think that ideal is the word that we would use with David Ajabu in that late second round range because of this. Because uh, for many mock drafts that we had been putting together or that many in Broncos country had been putting together from January until the Russell Wilson trade, many times the Denver Broncos at pick nine overall were taking who? David Ajabu. And now he suffers the Achilles injury, I believe, at the Michigan Pro Day, which obviously that complicates matters entirely. I mean, can you really say ideal with a guy that has an Achilles injury? I would say, I mean, sure. I mean, with the Broncos roster the way that it is, you could probably afford to take that risk, especially at pick 64. You know, there's very there's very little risk involved there in terms of, well, you tried it. You tried it with a second rounder. And maybe the Jake Butt thing would scare people off from potentially David Ajabu. But I would say, if you believe, if your team doctors believe that he can make a full recovery, I would say absolutely he's the ideal pick at number 64. I wouldn't trade up to get him, Cody. I wouldn't I wouldn't say he's worth multiple players in this draft to move up to get at this point with the injury. But I would say if he falls to 64, that is something that I would not pass on. Well, think about it this way, too, and I think that you made a great point talking about the roster. Like, the Broncos roster being right now what it is, I think if you're George Payton, you could take the risk on maybe drafting a guy like him if he is available. Like you mentioned, not trading up, but at 64, taking him there. And I go back to one player, too, in, in recent memory here, a, a guy who was a first-round prospect and obviously went in round number one, but the Tennessee Titans really took a chance on Jeffrey Simmons, who tore his ACL, wasn't even going to play his rookie season. Not to mention, Jeffrey Simmons had some off-the-field stuff, too, that people were concerned about about, but he still went round one. David Ojabu has so much talent, so much potential, and had a very explosive season this past year for Michigan.
Michigan opposite of Aiden Hutchinson, who's probably going to be the first overall player taken off the board in this year's NFL draft in Las Vegas in just several weeks away. But I think for the Broncos, if Ajabo is there, it doesn't hurt, I think, to take him because what you're getting is a guy that, you know, when he's healthy, can be one of the most explosive players on the football field. And it also addresses a position of need for the Broncos. And I think that with the roster the way it is right now, you don't have to have him this upcoming season, but he can work throughout the season, get in the building, be acclimated with the process, and then next season make his debut and just tear things up from there. That's one thing that I would like to see, Sarah. I know Broncos country would as well. Let us know what you thought about this episode down below here on YouTube or tweet us on Twitter at Cody Rourke NFL at Lockdown Broncos at Sarah Benjamin. We appreciate you so much, Broncos country, for making Lockdown Broncos your first listen of the day every single day. Make sure you're subscribed. You're following on this podcast and your favorite podcast provider. Make sure you hit that subscribe button here on the YouTube channel. Make sure you have the notifications turned on so you never miss out on a day's worth of Denver Broncos news, content, and coverage. Both Sarah Bettinger and myself will be back tomorrow for a brand new episode of the show.